Well, thank you everyone for joining. We'll get started now. Um, and this is a workshop around the infrastructure sector. And uh, we're running this workshop as part of a series of workshops uh, that is helping us put together the second version of the robotics roadmap for Australia. So um, I think I've put everyone on mute uh, and we are recording this session in case people haven't been able to join and that they would like to see it later. Um, to encourage participation, uh, we encourage you, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll endeavour to get to your questions by the time we get to the end of the session. Um, so first off, I would just like to acknowledge my co-chairs, some of whom you'll be hearing from this afternoon. Um, so first, Professor Sarath uh, Kodagoda, um, who is on the line and will be speaking to us this afternoon uh, to have a look at whether there are any major changes that we need to make to the roadmap. Um, Mary McGeek, who is, uh, will be taking us through uh, where we are now. Uh, Nathan Kirchner, who will um, wrap up the session today and um, uh, talk to you about ways that you can contribute. Because we are unable to do these workshops face-to-face -face at the moment, we have a survey so that we can collect responses. Dr. Tertha Banjipadhe, who will be taking us through, you know, why isn't more of the robotics work that we're doing in Australia being adopted by industry? And we've also been supported by um, Marion Ballot, uh, who I don't think is able to join us today. But thank you very much to my co-chairs. Now, my role in all of this, and I think I didn't introduce myself, my name is Sue Kay. And I'm the research director for cyber physical systems with CSIRO's Data61. And I led the development of the first robotics roadmap for Australia. And what I'm going to do is take you for a, a bit of a trip down memory lane about uh, how we got to where we are. And I guess a bit of the story behind the production of the first robotics roadmap. So um, a few years ago, I was very fortunate to be involved in setting up the Australian Centre for Robotic Vision, which is an Australian government funded centre of excellence, uh, which was focused on uh, bringing the uh, disciplines of robotics and computer vision together. And Australia is fortunate to have uh, quite a lot of talent in both of these areas. Now, one of the roles of a centre of excellence is to be a leader in the field, um, not just nationally, but also internationally. And in thinking about what that meant, um, I noticed that quite a lot of other countries had a roadmap around robotics. And when I use the term robotics, I'm using it in the very broadest sense to include computer vision, sensing systems, uh, other related technologies that of course robotics couldn't survive without. So uh, it is uh, robotics in the broadest possible sense. And not only do some other countries have roadmaps around robotics, but they uh, in many cases have very well articulated strategies around both robotics and artificial intelligence, which lead to policy recommendations and in some cases funding. Um, in the case of the US robotics roadmap, uh, which has now been through three different editions, uh, I was, uh, and which the Australian roadmap is largely based on, we were fortunate as part of the centre to have on our advisory board, Professor Henrik Christensen from the University of California, San Diego, as part of our advisory board. And Henrik has been the driving force in putting together the US roadmap for, and uh, from its very inception. Now the US robotics roadmap, has been very influential. Um, they were very fortunate in the early years of producing this roadmap to have a direct line into the uh, US government through a congressional committee that was focused on robotics technologies. And the second version of the roadmap, by the time they got to that, actually led to direct investment of more than $100 million into robotics research and development. So when I was having a look at other roadmaps around the world, and given that uh, I was able to ask Henrik a lot of questions, it seemed like a good roadmap to really uh, base the Australian roadmap on. So uh, in much the same way as the US roadmap, we've divided it into different sectors of the economy that are important to Australia and had a look at the influence that robotics can have on those sectors, and also identifying some of the good work that we're already doing in those sectors. Um, and when we put the first robotics roadmap together, uh, uh, you know, it was the first time I suppose that uh, we'd really thought about a few things. And one of the things that we discovered was that 
Australia really isn't using robots or indeed artificial intelligence more broadly at the same rate as many of our peer nations. So if you compare us to a country like the US, uh, we're not engaging in automation at the same rates. And a very common measure of how much different countries are adopting robotics is what we call the uh, robot population density of a country. So this is published every year by the International Federation of Robotics. And as you can see there, Australia has about 80 robots per 10,000 employees. And I must stress this is industrial robots. So these are the type of robots that you find uh, on the manufacturing factory floor. Um, often they don't move, they perform uh, very specific tasks such as uh, welding um, or putting things together. But when you compare us to a country like Korea, uh, who has is the top rated country in the world that has a population of 710 robots per 10,000 employees, uh, that's quite a disparity. And obviously there are differences between Australia's economy and the career of uh, the economy of, of South Korea. So um, in particular, South Korea has a very strong electronic component manufacturing um, part to their economy, which lends itself to the adoption of industrial robots. But I still think it's, uh, well, one, I think clearly we could be doing better, but two, I think it's unusual that we do have such a low um, uptake of robots. We are below the world average uh, because Australia does have a strong manufacturing sector, despite what many people might believe. And robots really can be very useful in the type of manufacturing that Australia specialises in, which you could describe as mass customisation. So being able to do specialty products. And the reason that that's important is that when I was talking about roadmaps in different parts of the world, I also mentioned that um, many other countries have very well developed strategies around robotics and artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, China in particular uh, has a very well articulated strategy in this area and their stated aim is that by this year, they will actually have a, um, uh, they will be beat Korea in terms of robot population density in their country. So if you can get a bit of a mental picture of that, China is planning to have more than 710 robots per 10,000 employees. And if you look at the size of the Chinese population, that's a truly mind boggling number. In fact, it's more robots uh, per 10,000 employees than Australia's human population. So that's a lot of robots. And China has also been very careful to try and maintain their sovereign capability in the production of industrial robots. So many of you may be aware that China purchased a company called Kuka Robotics from that was uh, originally German. And that is all part of their strategy to make sure that not only can they introduce a lot of robots to help keep their manufacturing sector competitive, but they wanna be able to make sure that they are building their own robots. Now, the reason that a lot of these figures are important to Australia is that uh, one thing that we know is that Australia's labour productivity has grown pretty steadily at an annual average of about 1.8%. But our productivity needs to be at 2.5% just for us to maintain our standard of living. So that's just maintaining it, not improving it. And the way that you bridge that gap between labour productivity and general productivity is most easily bridged through the application of technology. And robotics and automation and robotics related technologies um, are clearly an obvious way that we can help to bridge that gap. So it's important that we get this right. I'm just having a little bit of trouble moving. And we're operating in a, a fantastic time for robotics. Sorry, I've just jumped a slide. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate, anyone who's working in the field of robotics, uh, to be working in a time when most of society has a generally positive attitude towards the application of robotics. And this hasn't been true of a lot of other technologies that people are getting used to. So we're really uh, in, a, in a golden period of time where we can take advantage of that uh, public positivity towards robots to really make a difference. The 
other thing that we found when we were putting the first robotics roadmap together was actually um, what a fantastic array of companies uh, we were able to discover in Australia who are already doing great things. So many of you'd be aware that in um, the resources sector, Australia already leads the world in mining automation. But we have some other um, amazing companies like Fastbrick Robotics pictured there on the left, uh, a company, a startup out of Western Australia that is, is trying to um, break into the construction market with its bricklaying robot. Uh, we have robots applied to agriculture, robots applied to first response. We manufacture a range of sensors and vision systems that really are leaders in the world. And one of the things that we're hoping to do uh, by continuing this process of uh, having uh, new versions of the roadmap is to steadily unearth more of these fantastic examples of innovation that is already happening in Australia. Because ultimately, we want to make sure that we have an environment here in Australia where the talent and technologies that we're developing in Australia have opportunities to stay here in Australia. And another important element of the roadmap was actually just trying to figure out who and where all of these companies existed. So we had our first stab at doing a capability map and all of the red dots that you see on that map of Australia are actually uh, robotics or robotics related companies. Uh, now, one of the issues we had in trying to define Australia's capability, that it was twofold. One is that the Australian Bureau of Statistics does not collect any of this data. As you can imagine, uh, robotics and robotics related technologies can be applied to any sector of the Australian economy. And so they can be quite hidden in amongst other sectors and included in that data collected by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. So we looked at a database of uh, different companies in Australia using different keywords that would uh, I guess highlight the type of business that they were in. The keywords are highlighted there on the right. And what we found based on that search was that we believe and we think these are very conservative estimates that Australia has more than a thousand companies that are operating in this space, that conservatively they're employing more than 50,000 people and that they're worth upwards of $12 billion in revenue to the Australian economy. The reason that it's important for us to get a sense of the size of the robotics industry in Australia is because it's very hard to have any conversations with decision makers or investors if we can't give any numbers about what the industry looks like in Australia. And I think it would be fair to say that before we undertook that process of trying to put together a robotics roadmap for Australia, no one really had a good handle on what the, the industry looked like. And um, I think that this is going to be an ongoing process and that uh, hopefully we will get better at trying to, to nut out what these numbers actually are. The bubble diagram that you see on the left there uh, is really a way of trying to have a look at the different levels of uh, robotics activity that might be happening in different states. Uh, uh, many of the indicators are based on student numbers or number of research centres in different areas. But in many respects, there's no surprises there. The size of the bubbles pretty strongly correlate with the size of the population of each of Australia's states. And this was the product that we were able to publish in June in 2018. And this was, uh, our, as I said, our first attempt really to get a bit of a handle on not only what the robotics industry in Australia looked like, but also what its impact at the moment and also potentially into the future might be on different important sectors of the Australian economy. So I won't go in detail into all of the recommendations that came from the roadmap. There were more than 18. But we divided these more broadly into five different sections, five uh, different um, areas that we felt uh, needed to pay attention for industry. Um, I think it would be fantastic if we could encourage more investment and also for industries to be reskilling their people to be able to take advantage of uh, robotics and automation in their industry. Um, as far as the education sector is concerned, and I think that Australia is already going some way towards this, making sure that all Australians can be equipped with industry for relevant skills will be increasingly important in the future. For our government, uh, there are a number of different initiatives that we recommended that they could consider that would help support the robotics industry in this country. For our uh, researchers uh, and people looking at um, developing research, I think there's a lot more we can do in terms of being better coordinated. And 
I think there are also some uh, ways that the culture, I guess, within Australia uh, could support the development of robotics technologies. Because in general, I think robotics has been a well-kept secret in Australia. And Australians love a good underdog story. And I think there's many ways that we can inspire um, Australia. And just as I guess a lot of robotics developers are inspired by Australia's unique nature um, to really take forward uh, many challenging robotics technologies. So this workshop, we're focusing uh, particularly on the infrastructure sector, which is an unusual sector in as much as infrastructure is very uh, important to Australia. Um, in fact, it's one of the main reasons that Australia has developed a key strength in field robotics, because uh, we have thousands of kilometres of roads, railways, pipelines, bridges, things that need to be inspected and maintained. And yet with our small population, that's quite a challenge. So it's really pushed towards the development of technologies that can lend a hand to make sure that our infrastructure is in good shape. So infrastructure robotics is, is I guess, a thing in its own right. And we know that it's an area of significant investment. Perhaps after this COVID-19 um, crisis, it might even see increased investment um, but um, obviously infrastructure is different sectors of the Australian economy. So we did our best to try and pull it together and, and get a bit of a sense of what the general investment in infrastructure was and then what the influence of robotics uh, can be on infrastructure. And just to put that into perspective, this is um, a diagram that shows different sectors of the Australian economy. As you can see there, infrastructure is uh, one of the most important sections, uh, which has, um, you know, conservatively, it was actually quite hard to get the get numbers that agreed on this, uh, around $48 billion worth of investment by Australia. On the left-hand side of this diagram, um, in the purple, big purple circle, are uh, areas where Australia is investing money, whereas on the right-hand side in the, the large blue circle is areas which are making revenue for Australia. So in some cases, you can see healthcare exists on both sides of the circle because not only do we invest money in it, we, we also make money from healthcare. And the different colours of each of the sectors is really representing an idea that we had around how mature the adoption of robotics technologies are in different sectors. So the sectors in green are the ones that traditionally have led the way in Australia. So defence, manufacturing resources, probably no surprises there. Manufacturing has had robots for more than 70 years now. Um, but many of our other sectors are just starting to apply robotics. Infrastructure is gaining acceptance. So not as mature as those other three sectors, but, but more mature than many other sectors in the Australian economy. And the sectors in red, really, that's where they're just exploring. You don't see widespread adoption of robotics, but they're the sectors that actually uh, could see huge transitions when those technologies do end up being applied. Now, one thing that we found as we were putting the roadmap together were that many of the sectors um, actually appreciated that they could probably learn more from other sectors than perhaps within their own. And so this is an interesting challenge. Not only do we tend to measure things um, uh, such as economic statistics by dividing things up into sectors, it can also create unintentional barriers to the diffusion of information. So we heard from manufacturers, for example, that they'd really like to find out what was happening in the resources space to find out what they might be able to learn. So I'm not sure that we actually have the answer to how we can better break down some of those silos because, you know, if you work in construction, it's uh, it's unlikely that you, you might turn up to a manufacturing con conference, you never know, but uh, you know, traditionally we do stick to our individual sectors. Um, and yet there's a lot of benefit to being able to break those barriers down. And I suppose the roadmap just by illustrating what's happening in different sectors is one way of uh, helping to do that. The, another recommendation that came from the roadmap, uh, the roadmap was the, around the importance of trying to create technology clusters. So robotics doesn't operate in a vacuum. It's a part of the tech sector within Australia and I think there's a lot that we could be doing to try and coordinate activities 
uh, not just within the robotics community, but more broadly, so that in areas like manufacturing, we really can have a go at mass customization and reshoring jobs back to Australia. And while the roadmap can't claim credit, I mean, one outcome that has happened since it was published is the development of an advanced robotics manufacturing hub um, and uh, a few other things that have happened. Um, uh, I guess, sorry, one thing I needed to point out was one of the, the secrets or keys to developing clusters is to have them in close proximity. So this is an example of a successful technology cluster that has developed in the city of Pittsburgh in the United States. Pittsburgh was going through a pivotal moment where its steel industry closed down and some of the leading lights within the city decided that they didn't want to go down without a fight and they decided that technology was their best opportunity to make sure that Pittsburgh um, didn't suffer an economic collapse. And so um, they were able to encourage a lot of technology companies to locate themselves in Pittsburgh. They were also fortunate that there was um, some strong university research presence there to supply a lot of the talent. And this close proximity of companies is very important because one, it encourages talent to stay in the area because there are a lot of opportunities, but two, um, it also encourages just general dis diffusion of knowledge across different companies. So it's not that people are stealing IP from one company and transferring it to the other, just by virtue of talent moving from one to the other, people are able to gain best practice knowledge and move it from one company to the next. So this has been quite important in Pittsburgh. Um, since the development of the first roadmap, we have seen the emergence of a Queensland robotics cluster, which is just getting underway. And we are now also forming a, a more formal um, national network called the Robotics Australia Network to try and make sure that we can uh, leverage off the, the mass that we actually already have. A few other things that have come out since the first robotics roadmap um, are these two studies. One is particularly focused on Queensland, the robotics and automation advantage for Queensland. And uh, there are a lot of interesting lessons there, not just for Queensland, but for other states in terms of the importance of adoption of these technologies for um, the economy. And then Alpha Beta also released a report that was more specifically around some of the advantages of these uh, technologies uh, for the mining and resources sectors. So they're also useful sources of information if you're interested. Now, one of the things that came from the Queensland study of um, uh, adoption of robotics and automation were that, uh, and these were again, very conservative estimates that um, over the next 10 years, uh, adoption of robotics and automation could help um, create an additional $77 billion worth of gross state product and create more than 725,000 jobs. And those new jobs were, um, I guess, the, the, the caveat with that, though, is that those are different jobs to the jobs that currently exist. So an important step in trying to take advantage of some of the application of these technologies is to ensure that the current workforce is well prepared to be able to transition into these new jobs. So while there's a lot of evidence that robots actually create jobs rather than um, leading to job destruction, these are different jobs to jobs that have existed in the past. And a lot of the opportunity and benefit that we will gain from applying these technologies really only accrues if we take um, consideration of that and make sure that people are well prepared and given the skills that they need to take advantage of these technologies. The other thing that the study found was that Australia's opportunity, and this is true more broadly for artificial intelligence as well as robotics, is that our opportunity is time limited. So all of the benefits that were discovered that could happen just for Queensland by adopting robotics and automation disappear if you take too long to adopt those technologies. So if we delay and we do not encourage the uptake of these technologies, then we do not um, get any uh, economic benefit and arguably will be behind many other parts of the world um, for the foreseeable future if we fail to do this right. So some of the outcomes from the roadmap, um, it got quite a lot of coverage. I think it's fair to say it's increased the awareness of robotics in Australia. 
I mentioned that it's led to a, a couple of initiatives now that are sort of coalescing into a national robotics network. The Queensland Robotics Cluster has emerged. I think we're starting to change the narrative that you often see around robots and jobs into one more of job creation. And the Australia's chief scientist, Alan Finkel, who was at the launch of the roadmap, um, identified three key takeaways from his perspective, and, and that is that we have to recognise that many of Australia's traditional industries actually are high tech. We often think that Australia doesn't have much of a tech sector, but that discounts the amount of tech being done in many of our traditional industries. Uh, and those industries really are building Australia's tech capacity. Um, and clearly we need a more diverse workforce or we're going to be missing out on 50% of the talent. One of the most rewarding aspects of putting the roadmap together was, uh, as I've, I think I might have mentioned, just unearthing some of the uh, amazing work that's currently happening in Australia in robotics that I think most Australians would be justifiably proud of. And I think one of the key uh, challenges um, with the roadmap and I think ongoing for uh, robotics and, and the people who develop robotics technologies in Australia is actually just becoming more visible and having people appreciate that a lot of these things are happening in Australia. And if you want to have a successful tech career, you don't necessarily have to leave our shores. So uh, the reason that we're planning to do a second version of the roadmap is really to keep momentum going. So the first roadmap served to raise some general awareness and give us a bit of a snapshot of where we think the industry is at, but we need a lot more work to really define that well. Uh, in particular, something that we could do a lot better in the second version of the roadmap will be looking um, at what are the five, 10 and 15 year horizon um, goals that we should be having in developing different technologies. Um, I think if we were to map that out very clearly, then it will also be clear what opportunities there are for Australia. There will obviously be some things that it might make more sense for us to gain from uh, other people who are working in robotics in other parts of the world. But I think there are also areas where Australia can make a unique contribution and make a difference. Another important aspect is for us to keep unearthing capability. Uh, as I mentioned, that was one of the most re rewarding aspects of the first robotics roadmap. We were able to put forward some um, really interesting case studies and we would love to keep unearthing that capability because I think we really only did scratch the surface of some of the very interesting things that people are doing in developing these technologies in Australia. Uh, and obviously our end goal is to hope that we can establish a really clearly recognised robotics industry in Australia. I think it's fair to say that the robotics industry as it currently stands in Australia is still immature and quite fragmented, uh, but that is something that we can change uh, as we gain awareness for the sector and start to get it to operate in a more coordinated manner. And I've got a survey link there. We've also been circulating this out on social media. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to have this workshop in person so that we can record all of your ideas uh, but please fill in the survey so that we can hear your views or if you would like to offer up a case study, let us know about some particularly interesting work that's going on in robotics in this country. Uh, we'd encourage you to, to give us that information. So once again, I'd like to thank uh, my co-chairs for this infrastructure section of the Robotics Roadmap. And I'm going to pass over to Mary McGeeck who uh, will talk about where we are now. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Sue. Uh, so yes, uh, again, thank you, Sue. Um, that was a comprehensive introduction of the background, um, the Australian and global context of the objectives of these highly relevant workshops, uh, as well as the case studies, research and other works completed to date in, in the first version of the roadmap. So as Sue said, hello, I'm Mary McGill. I'm one of the co-chairs of this infrastructure workshop for the Australian Robotics Roadmap for Australia version um, two. So as we heard from Sue, we're holding a series of workshops nationwide to progress the second edition of the Robotics Roadmap for Australia, looking at the impact of robotics and related technologies on the infrastructure sector in Australia. The first Robotics Roadmap highlighted the potential for um, 23 billion plus global dollars in the global market for robot, robotics and autonomous systems by 2025. 
So as you can see, it's a highly relevant um, um, piece of work that, that Sue is undertaking here with our support. Um, we've included, just a reminder, um, the reference of the first edition of the Roadmatic, uh, Robotics Roadmap that Sue spoke to. It was the 2018 edition. Um, and also a, another reminder, please contribute to our online survey. We're encouraging ideas as to how the robotics community can aid in Australia's recovery from our most recent crisis, being COVID-19, um, and not forgetting other recent challenges such as the bushfires, which I dare say we'll, we'll see again um, forward in Australia. So my role today is just to be introducing the first of three key questions. It's question one. The question is, where are we now? So through this question, we are seeking to understand what have we achieved as an infrastructure community? Or what have we achieved in fragments throughout our communities? I'm going to host a follow-up ARN infrastructure workshop on the question of where are we now? I want to create a picture of what Australia's current state adoption rate of robotic technology is. What are the benefits that are currently being realised from a monetary skills and growth perspective, research yes. perspective and outcomes perspective? Within this workshop, we will want to hear about the current partnerships, universities, laboratories, joint ventures, research, case studies. Since 2018, those currently being undertaken in the different industries um, within the infrastructure sector as a whole and the lessons that we're learning and adopting from those that have succeeded and those that have not succeeded. Everyone on this call has the opportunity to be all inclusive about what is going on at the moment in this space and how to better reflect upon the way in which we are positioned forward. In the workshop we'll seek to understand which areas should we update from version one of the roadmap, what else that we haven't included should we include in version two. The workshop will then focus on moving on to consider major changes required. This will be in a separate workshop hosted by Sarah. For example, we might centre on robotic technologies as the all-encompassing um, issue that Sue spoke to. This might incorporate technology, uh, uh, e economy and data insights and trends, computer and machine vision, AI and machine or deep learning, automation and autonomous systems, but extend to university courses, labour shortage, ageing population, productivity, and our future works, uh, workforce skills shortage or uh, gaps. So the goal of this workshop will be to align ourselves to devise, develop and contribute case studies and a chapter section recommendations and content towards our new roadmap. To this end, we've set up an online repository for everyone to submit their individual contributions. And the co-chairs will circulate these events post the event today. The outcome of this workshop will go towards the infrastructure section of the second Australian Ro Robotics Roadmap. And for those who attend and are interested, will be asked, if willing, to provide a 200 to 300 word test case on their experiences in order to add more depth um, and diversity to this roadmap. So I do call out that um, perhaps you want to consider preparing a case study for inclusion. Um, and if you want to do so, please feel free to approach any one of the co-chairs on today's call. So after this webinar, within the next week, we'll send consolidated feedback and encourage you to register to the new e-newsletters available on the website. And we'll always work to provide further information and support. And what I'll do now is um, to introduce the second question, I will throw over to um, Sarah. Thank you. Yep, all good. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, my name is Sarah Kodagura and I'm uh, um, Professor in the University of Technology, Sydney, um, and um, my background is in robotics. So I have been uh, working in this robotics area for 20 years, and I was fortunate to uh, be involved in the um, first um, our roadmap, first version of the roadmap. I was a co-chair of the uh, um, infrastructure sector of that uh, particular the first version of the uh, workshop. 
So um, when we look at the, uh, uh, the infrastructure sector, as Sue and Mary mentioned, it is um, it's a big area and, and uh, there are a lot of opportunities out there, especially when we are looking at the challenges that we are facing and that we are going to face in terms of, for example, the population growth and related uh, uh, housing demand, urban sprawl, and increased congestion of our roads. There are unprecedented uh, pressures on our infrastructure and also aging population, uh, natural disasters. We have just uh, you know, experienced um, uh, with bushfires season and then uh, high temperatures, uh, coastal fires and also this COVID related um, disasters. Um, those all relate into applying pressures on our infrastructure, climate change, and also emerging security threats. So all of them are uh, demanding more infrastructures and more innovations in the infrastructure. For example, how the infrastructure is built or how the infra infrastructure is maintained how the infrastructure is decommissioned. So it is a whole life cycle of um, innovations that are required in order to be uh, on top of this uh, area. So the question is, do we need any major changes to what we are doing now? As you all know, we are doing great jobs. Uh, Sue has mentioned that in the presentation. Uh, we are doing great. Um, and. Um, do we need uh, many changes to what we do? For example, if I take for just a few examples, say um, we have robots in um, Harbor Bridge uh, uh, identifying the corroded areas and um, blasting the bridges or going inside the arches and basically understanding uh, or visualizing or inspecting um, the arches in constrained environment or confined environment. Um, then we have um, technologies to um, inspect roads or railroad. We have technologies uh, out there to inspect um, underwater structures, for example, ship hulls, pylons, dams, oceans, uh, ocean beds, so on and so forth. So having doing this all great work, do we still need uh, to do some changes um, to the way that we do or to the, um, the approach that we are going to take. That is one of the questions that we, um, we still need to address. And then do we want to change how we talk about it? As we know, there are so many stakeholders in this um, domain. Uh, so infrastructure itself uh, can be uh, you know, defined in different ways, maybe uh, talking about um, transport infrastructure, communication infrastructure, power line infrastructure, building infrastructure, so that sort of a categorization. Or somebody might simply say that, you know, it is a public-owned infrastructure and private-owned infrastructure. Or someone else might say that, well, these are above-ground infrastructures, underground infrastructures, or underwater infrastructures. So there are many ways of uh, talking in these directions, but, uh, you know, do we want to change how we want to talk about it is another question. Another question is about um, do we want to change um, how, we are, how we are perceived? So there are, again, uh, uh, different um, stakeholders in this domain. There are policymakers, there are adapters, um, there are end users, there is general public out there. How they are thinking about us, how they are thinking about the robotics in in in, uh, in terms of um, how they are going to affect them. For example, is there a fear of uh, losing jobs? Um, there's a threat to jobs. Are people uh, uh, not still accepting this technology, or is it a general public? Uh, what are they thinking about it? And then uh, things relating to uh, the uh, um, the uh, security, data security, and uh, privacy issues, how we are going to handle it, or if this technology is um, um, complete enough to be used in, uh, in um, infrastructure areas. So these this sort of uh, things are um, basically defining how we are going, uh, we are perceived in the community. So that is uh, one other question that we wanted to discuss further. 
Then another question is about, do we want to change how we are organized? As you, as you mentioned, uh, the, um, we have a great robotics community. We have um, a small robotics community as well, and they are fragmented um, all over Australia. So uh, we have organizations like ARA, Australian Robotics and Automation Association, and also to mention about the Australian Robotics Network. So their associations are they are trying to bring people together. Do we want to think about how um, these things uh, work together and what sort of a scope they are going to have and how can they help in bringing all these people to um, work together in a synergetic way? Um, to also mention about the forming clusters. Um, could be a good way of uh, for you know getting or bringing the synergy together in order to do bigger things. So is that the way to go, or is there any other ways to go? So that is uh, you know another question about do we want to change how we are organized? So that basically covers um, very briefly that what I wanted to uh, you know discuss in the upcoming workshop. So there will be workshops uh, announced uh, soon about webinars just to discuss particular aspects of, um, of these uh, issues that we want to really address in the next version of the workshop. And also, if I may say that uh, the question six of the survey which was distributed uh, um, is addressing basically this, um, this, uh, this question. So if you've got, really, uh, if you've got time, I really I invite you to put your thoughts in there so that um, we can have a good uh, discussion afterwards in a workshop. So that's basically what I wanted to cover given the limited time. And uh, I would now like to invite or hand over to Tita uh, to uh, go to the next question um, that uh, he would like to discuss. Thank you. Thanks, Arat. Um, I'm Gita. Uh, I'm a research scientist in, in CSIRO. And for the past few years, I've been working very closely in developing robotic technologies and interacting with industry to figure out how to send some of these robots into the industry to do infrastructure inspection. Um, in my opinion, whenever we find uh, the issue of adoption of robotics is, is a standard issue across the whole board. It's very heartening to see that robots are being accepted more and more by the general public. Um, uh, that's something that Sue, uh, Sue showed us earlier. But there is still a barrier between how we perceive robotics within our community and how the robotics is being perceived by the general public and how the robotics is being perceived by the industry. So this perception actually leads us to having different standards on what robotics is and what is infection infrastructure inspection robotics should be. So let me talk about a couple of different aspects and domains in which uh, this falls under. There are significant technical challenges on the robots itself. Um, in many cases, the structures that are built, they are really complex environments, and robots, robots themselves are pretty complex machines. Um, so they have their sensing capabilities, they have their locomotion capabilities, and they have to do some missions. Now, as we know from, from building a machine, the larger the number of complexity um, that exists in the machine, the larger is the chance for it to fail. Um, so the robots are getting better and better, but there are many areas where the, the, robot, the maturity of the robotics technology is still not there. Often that's the case for open research questions, but also it's a case where there hasn't been well-established, standardized uh, metrics against which robots are being measured. Um, the second problem is, as Sarat was saying, the infrastructure domain itself is spread across many different aspects. So you have land infrastructures, you have underwater infrastructures. So what we talk about infrastructure itself is a very generic term. And often what we find is we have this uh, scenario where because of the aging infrastructure, we are, we are starting to build in robots to fix those issues, to identify early detection of failures. I'm quite uh, positive and optimistic in a sense that when we start talking about the new infrastructure setups that are being built, they have started to incorporate lessons from robotics to 
ensure that these are the um, environments that are robot friendly. Now, when the environment is quite brittle and quite um, structurally variant, the complexity of the robot then becomes an issue in itself. The second major issue of towards adoption of robotics is again human perception. Now, the human perception of what a robot is is different from um, in when I say human, the general public acceptance of the robot is is quite different from what the robotics community thinks the robot is. So the, often there's a the case where there's a lack of information um, on what the state of the art is. There's a lack, lack of perception of, of what the robots could do, what the robots are supposed to do, and what the robots are not supposed to do. So these are very standardized. Uh, so, so these are not very standardized across different domains. For example, for a ground vehicle, like, like a self-driving car, the acceptance of robots are much higher because the, the base platform itself is so complex. The cars that are, that are running on the roads, they have so much intelligence in themselves that adding the next level of intelligence comes reasonably, um, it can be morphed into a much more general mental model for how the public accepts it. Uh, even though we know that there are significant challenges that need to be cleared before those can be uh, applied on the road. Um, and often what we find is the perception of the roboticist and then the perception of the industry, um, they come together in a common language. We often find that standardization of this language is missing. Uh, when we actually look at, for example, when we talk about inspection of the robot, often the, the problem that comes to mind from a robotics perspective is, and I'm, I'm grossly generalizing here, uh, from the robotics perspective is, yes, we have a robot, <clears throat> we strap on a sensor, and the task of the robot is to actually go around and collect data. Often from the industry perspective is the outcome of the data that's interesting, not the robot itself. So, so the emphasis that's being provided by the robotics researchers and then the robotics acceptance in the industry is quite different. So often we end up talking about different languages, which lead to a little bit of variations in what the acceptance rate should be. Um, as I was mentioning, I'm, I'm very uh, optimistic in the way that the robotics is being now accepted into the industry. There are lots of uh, activities happening around that, there are lots of revenue generation, specifically in the domain of inspection robotics. There are lots of companies starting up bringing these sectors on. So I would have some of the recommendations that I think would, would actually help towards bridging this gap between acceptance and address some of the concerns from the industry. Um, I would suggest that there should be some kind of a cross-domain standardization. Again, going back to the previous point, we have the inspection tasks, for example, in different industries, which are fundamentally quite similar from the robotics perspective, but from the industry and logistics, and the acceptance point of view, they have quite different um, standards. For example, the robustness of the robot that's required to do inspection for um, an agricultural field, for example, fruit picking, right? Uh, fruit identification and stuff is quite different from deploying a robot in an oil and gas industry because the risk profile is quite different. The logistics is quite different. But if you peel off the structure, underlying robotics research has the same repeated research questions. How does the robot move? Can it sense? Can it avoid obstacles? Can it interact with the environment in a reasonable and robust manner? So having a standardized mechanism of, of talking between the industry and the robotics can come from mapping some of these open research questions to the tasks that are general enough that can be applied in many different domains, and then talking about how those domains actually interpret those tasks. So, for example, from the point of view of our coverage planning, when we talk about coverage planning, what we want is the robot to go around and collect data of the whole infrastructure, and then come back and give that report to the industry. The data that's being collected depends on the sensor. The sensor that's sitting on top of the robot actually determines what kind of robots would be used. So often what happens is if you have a standardized language of talking between the industry and the robotics, um, then we have standardized benchmarks against which the, both the robotics community 
and the acceptance from the industry can happen. And often a key component of this, this uh, glue that holds researchers and large industries is the SMEs. So in my opinion, SMEs are the key component that the robotics SMEs and service industry SMEs, infrastructure inspection SMEs are the key component uh, in this whole gluing together of these two communities and ensuring that the acceptance happens. So they are the key translators of the cutting edge research into a product that gets deployed at higher tier level. So we should find a way to actually support these SMEs both from the research point of view, but also from the funding point of view. And often what happens is uh, we need to bring our industry along and expose a lot of the cutting edge research that's happening uh, to the industry. Often, because, because the robotics community actually comes up with novel robotics um, solutions, new breakthroughs in science and technology, new sensors, new robots, new materials, the previously determined questions of well, can the robot do this becomes invalidated very soon. A robot which the robotics, uh, the, the robotics capability that couldn't do a particular task six months previously could be able to do the task six months in the future. So there should be a very strong mechanism of information transfer between the, the requirements of the industry and the cutting edge science. And often uh, industry expos that are cross domain, but scientific and technological uh, endeavors between the industry and the research community becomes important. And one of the successful stories that I have, in my opinion, that has come out is that of Sprint Robotics. So Sprint Robotics has looked at infrastructure robotics from the perspective of civil, maintenance, maritime, as well as oil and gas. And they bring together these industry bodies to participate and propose what the current challenges are. And the key part of this community is the SMEs that participate and say what is the standardized uh, tests and what are the standardized robots that could be utilized across the domains. <clears throat> and from that discussion comes uh, the topic of certification. Now, if a robot task has been certified, um, uh -huh. or, uh -huh. oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm getting to you. Uh, just say, just say one, one extra thing and then let me um, make the close so we stay on time. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the, the last thing that I want to put in is having grand challenges to actually benchmark the, the capabilities consistently and regularly across different tasks um, is going to be an important aspect of that. Um, so based on that, I'm, I'm, I'm quite interested in hearing your opinions and your comments, and we can set up aspects of the conversation on the on the workshop um, um, documentation I shared previously. Uh, with that, um, handing it over back to Nathan. Thanks, Nathan. I actually think, Tertha, you just did a spectacular job of proving the point that I wanted to start with. So it is clear to any of us that look around that we've done lots and lots in this country. We have lots of solid fragments. We've got a lot of groundwork and we've, we've achieved a lot of impressive stuff. We're really in a situation now where we've, perhaps we've overshoot, overshot. So we need to focus on making it known that we've even been doing anything, which means more visibility. It means more events like this. It means more um, connections. We need to bring it all together so we can actually uh, stop reinventing the wheel and start using the technology more broadly. We need to close the little gaps because there are still plenty of things we haven't done. We really need to shift the perceptions out there, what we're actually trying to achieve and what needs to be achieved. And frankly, we need to shut up and actually go and do something, which is a very important bit. If we do do all of these things, it's going to significantly increase our chances of success, which means we'll be more effective in doing what we want to do. And we can live anywhere on that spectrum. We can think commercially, we'll open new markets, they'll give us possibilities that we never uh, otherwise wouldn't have seen. If you think about researchers, that gives us problems to solve we've never looked at before. If you think about a community, it's just vindication that what we're trying to do actually is for something. It's significantly stronger. Now the ask, but to do any of this, we sincerely and definitely need your help. And I mean, the whole country's help, not, not just the people here. We need your input. We need to clarify what's actually out there. 
We need to clarify what we need. We have to clarify what we're trying to do. We need to focus from that and we need to unlock some of the reasons why we haven't been more successful at communicating and doing and achieving. And we need to develop mechanisms to push that forward. That is the primary purpose of the roadmap is to uh, start us off with. Try and work out why we aren't having the successes that we should be having and to just get in there and actually solve get in there and actually produce something we can operationalize as a country and succeed. So with that, we have a few mechanisms. First one is please participate in the surveys. The uh, survey is very short, very easy, very simple. That really just has a couple of questions that tie to these major um, topic areas that Mary Sarath and Tertha have, have brought up. That helps direct conversations to the next level. So we can be talking about where we are, what we've done, what we need to change, why aren't we getting more traction. Uh, the survey will direct to that, which leads into please participate in those uh, forthcoming breakout workshops so we can actually hear more of what uh, the community or you guys have to say about what we should be doing or what we should have been doing in the past. Yes, the past sucked, but let's make the future better. Um, and please provide case studies. Uh, everyone likes a success story, especially the more sales and PR amongst us. Jason, I'm looking at you. Success stories are great, put some in, we'll publish them, it'll be great. But we're really, really at the stage where we want to hear the failures. We really want to know raw case studies and we want to know what we could have done differently so it would have worked. Those stories of we got somewhere and it was meaningful, but we could have done so much more if only these things hadn't happened, actually gives us something we can unify against and solve, actually make some progress. So with that, my glorious rant is over. Thank you you everyone for participating please keep talking please talk as loudly as absolutely possible and please know that our role is to listen to hear to amplify everything you say and think and to unify us so we all succeed that's all i've got i don't know if um do you want to say something no thanks nathan i think that's covered it um there's not a lot of action on the the chat people must be being a bit shy so um please do get in touch with us in some way though either through the survey or uh you know you can contact us individually or uh through a variety of means just as nathan said it's really great to be able to keep unearthing some of the interesting work that's already going on and yeah we're we're very interested to to get your opinions thank you and thank you very much Mary, Tertha, Sarath, and Nathan. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.